Welcome back, everybody. This is The Social Brain. My name is Taylor Guthrie. This is my co-host, Andrew Cooper Sansone. Thank you so much for continuing to, to watch us and to, to tune in. We appreciate all the help that we can get. Uh, we very much want to do this as free as we can for consumers because we believe in getting this kind of education out to people, allowing people to have insight into their own mind, into their social processes and everything. Uh, but every little bit of help does help us keep this going. Uh, and so if you're willing, if you're able, uh, check out our Patreon account. Uh, there's a, a link down here that you can check out. We also have kind of a, a merch shop down below with some like stickers and things like that. Um, it's all, all of that goes right back into this to make this show better, to, to give us more time to research and do, do all of these things. So uh, today we're uh, ironically talking about persuasion as I try to persuade <laughs> you to help us out. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to kick it over to my co-host and he's going to get us started. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, when we think about persuasion, I think uh, I just want to like clarify a few things because persuasion can have this, I think, bad connotation to it, this like manipulation kind of thing. But um, what I want you to think about when we're going through this is that as social animals, as reasoning animals, as human beings, we really have two options for doing, for getting other people to do anything. And the first is violent, you know, force, coercion, um, and that one uh, we typically think is is pretty unethical. Uh, there are definitely times when you know uh, to prevent further harm or or um, in other situations, violent force could be justified. But typically, um, we would prefer peaceful persuasion, right? The the ability to to change somebody's uh, thoughts and uh, attitudes and behaviors. Uh, without forcing them to, and through conversation. Um, so, so if you're an ethical person, you know your your really only option for changing people's behavior is typically persuasion. Um, so yeah, and I said it it gets this bad rap because it sounds just like psychological manipulation. It sounds like something that you know I don't know. Like once you say the word persuasion, it just sounds like you're you're a manipulative kind of uh, operator, but um, that's true. People can use persuasion. They can use, you know, coercive persuasion or like brainwashing to, to do horrible things. But um, that's true for all useful tools that, that humanity has come up with, whether they're psychological or physical or whatever. Um, and this persuasion, this ability to convince or change someone's mind is really one of the most important things, important tools we have in modern life. And like, you know, just some examples to, to get a job, to get um, a better job, you have to persuade your potential employer through a good resume, a persuasive interview to hire you, um, to sell any kind of product or get more clients or increase your business in any way. You have to persuade potential customers to buy from you or to consider buying from you. And if you're even like a therapist or coach, in some way you, you have to be persuasive to your clients to help them change their thoughts and feelings and behaviors. Um, and so just the bottom line here is that really any kind of meaningful change you want to make in society, uh, you know, if you want to do it in a way that's, that's ethical and, and you should, uh, you, you have to persuade large numbers of people to kind of see the world in a similar way as you. And uh, that can be even just a small way. But this episode, we're really going to be talking about the psychology and kind of what's known about the neuroscience of persuasion. Yeah. Uh, and I, I very much want to kind of like piggyback on that because you do get this kind of like sleazy salesman kind of idea <laughs> when you think about some of these things. Uh, and I think something to really couch it in is uh, some of the philosophical perspectives like from Kant of when persuasion is used in an unethical way, it's usually using someone as a means to an end and not as a means within themselves. Uh, that a lot of the, the persuasion that is viewed in a really positive way, education, therapy, all of these kind of things are the persuasion being used in this, this helpful way where you're, you're seeing that person as a person. Uh, and it's really interesting to see that kind of despite the negative connotations that it might have, uh, there's this really interesting, clear stuff going on 
in the brain uh, across all of these different domains with any kind of like meaningful change that really taps into a lot of the self-concept stuff that we've talked about on this podcast before. Uh, and so I think we're, we're going to start by getting into some of these like psychological concepts of where a lot of this was was born of uh, what are these these principles of persuasion that have really been studied behaviorally. Like we see that these are the, the techniques that people are using when they're trying to persuade people. Uh, but then once we look under the hood, what is it that's really driving all of these things in the brain that's, that's predictive of whether someone's going to change their perspective or not? Yeah. And throughout all this, we want this to be like useful to you. And so we're going to be going through some of the, the psychology and, and bringing up sort of real life examples of uh, where these principles are applied. And then, like Taylor said, talking about the, the neuroscience as well, and then coming back to how you can uh, you know, be a more effective persuader in, in whatever you do. Um, but I guess we could just get started with some of the, yep. the social psychology. And here we're going to be drawing really heavily on the work of uh, Robert Cialdini, who is a, a kind of pioneering social psychologist. But he wrote this book called Influence in uh, the early 80s. And there's recently a new and updated edition that came out a couple years ago. Um, and he identified these six and now actually seven principles of persuasion that uh, pop up throughout uh, the social psychology literature, as well as um, real life examples of like in sales and uh, other kind of you know, compliance uh, oriented professions. So I'll just jump right into the first one is um, the first principle is reciprocity. So um, this is interesting. It's just the idea that people feel obliged to reciprocate when they receive something, when they're given something, some kind of gift, especially, and especially when it's personalized and unexpected. Um, and so one example of this that, that Robert Cialdini mentions is uh, at restaurants, if you, when you receive, when you get the check after you've eaten your meal, if you, uh, if there's a mint or some free chocolate or something mm -hmm. in that, uh, w along with the check, you're more likely to uh, increase your tip. It your tip will be higher than it would have been if there was no mint in there. But and, and it's also even higher if there's two mints he's found. But, <laughs> but then um, then on the other hand, there is uh, a kind of extension of that is they found that in this study where they were studying the effects of mints on people's tipping behavior, if the, uh, the, the waiter comes by, gives you uh, the check with one mint in it, and then as he's walking away, he turns around and says, Oh, well, for you nice people, I'm going to give you a second mint. That not only increases tipping uh, up to the level of two mints, but above and beyond. Like, uh, I can't remember the exact numbers, but way higher than just leaving the mints there. And that's where that sort of personalized uh, personalization and unexpected aspects of this come in. Yeah, and I think that, I mean, hearkening back to some of the previous episodes that we've done on like dopamine and, and value in general, uh, is that a lot of our value stuff is actually picking up on unexpected reward that we get very used to the same things that we see all the time. I mean, even going to a restaurant is just kind of like standard, like sea mints or whatever. Uh, but that that small little thing that they did of, of having someone turn around and give you something that was about you and was unexpected actually peaks these things in your brain is saying like, this is new, this is different. This is a, a learning opportunity. This is something that's, that's like, I need to pay attention to. Uh, and reciprocity is what drives our our communities like that is why we're as social of a species as we are when you smile at someone they smile back right and there's also negative reciprocity right when i get really angry with someone they get really angry back i mean we have this this comment about uh, i believe yelling at someone or punishing someone to change behavior doesn't work that's because you get negative reciprocity back from that right like you get defensive you're like i don't ah right uh and so flipping that on its head in a persuasive way is like uh, there's a reason why ChatGPT released free to everyone, right? It was like, here's this this trial pre period that you get to check out this really cool new AI. Um, and now they have millions and millions of paid users. 
because it was it was part of this like oh wow I was able to try this thing and see it and use it uh, and you know what I'm I'm willing to pay how much they they gave me because I, I want to kind of give back. Yeah, that's a really great point. Like free samples in general are based on this idea. You go into a grocery mm. store. I don't even know. I haven't seen them do this. Definitely not since COVID, but uh, they <laughs> used to at least have little, you know, they'd stand there with like the samples and give you something. And then, <laughs> you know, they just, they don't, a they sometimes ask you to buy it, but it's just like to try and trigger this, this reciprocity. Um, in addition to getting you to see kind of like the quality or whatever you like mm -hmm. about the product. Um, and then, sorry, to just uh, piggyback on this question in the chat about uh, yelling at someone or punishing them, not seeming to change behavior. Um, I think there is like evidence that that uh, punishment can change people's behavior. But to your point, um, I talked to a, 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 a dog psychologist a while back, um, <laughs> Ellen Furlong, and she, she mentioned that um, it's more effective when training dogs, it's more effective to um, reward them for what you want them to do rather than punish them for what you don't want them to do. So um, maybe something there. Um, but okay. Let's, Same thing with children. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just got to um, highlight like dog psychologist with the last name Furlong. Uh, I know, right? Yeah, it's meant to <laughs> <But> be. Anyway, <laughs> so let's go on to the second one. Um, okay, so the second one is scarcity. Um, scarcity is kind of obvious. People desire things more when they perceive them to be scarce. And that sounds kind of obvious, but it also is, is weird because, uh, you know, just because there's less of something doesn't mean that you should value it more necessarily. Um, but this is uh, one of the, the examples that Cialdini gives is that when British Airways decided to stop flying uh, between London and New York at some point, uh, the, they, they announced this. And then like the next day, uh, people were, were uh, buying flights, like just as many as they could on this, this flight from London to New York. Um, you know, it didn't change the flight. It didn't, nothing was different except that, oh, we're not going to be doing this anymore. So limited time offer, you got to do this now. And this is a, this is a huge underlying principle to like the history of economics. Like it, there's been this huge debate for hundreds of years now, as we've been trying to figure out, like, how do people make decisions about how much to spend on something, about how much something's worth? Um, and there was this whole like uh, group of like German philosophers that, that really started to push this idea that like value is based on scarcity, that a, a cup of water is going to cost a lot more to someone who is just like deserted in the desert than to someone who has access to like a free water fountain, right? It's about having something that you that you really need that's that's not around. Uh, I mean, there's a reason why they don't flood the market with like diamonds and, and they talk about how diamonds are so scarce and precious. And so you'll spend more money on them. Yeah. And uh, uh, in a, the book, Cialdini also explains that like part of the reason this works is because prices do often reflect value like uh, quality mm -hmm. rather um but there are times when they when uh they can just be made to to reflect scarcity and then that can can kind of trigger this principle but um that's kind of actually a theme with a lot of these things is that there is kind of a, a rational basis to why we uh tend to fall into these sort of persuasion traps, if you want to call them that, like there's a reason underlying it. It's not just random. But then when the conditions that make that like a rational choice aren't there, we still sometimes uh, kind of go along. It's sort of like a cognitive bias. These are all kind of examples of cognitive biases yeah. that we have. And that's a that's a really good point that I think we should highlight as we kind of go through the rest of these is that when you look at a lot of the the research into persuasion, um, there were some research studies originally that were like asking people to like reflect on like whether or not the persuasion was successful or something like that, um, and they got a lot of flack because when you really look at it, we don't have a lot of insight into whether or not something was successful. We don't really know why we're changing our opinion most of the time. Um, and that's why these are these are really interesting how they've kind of sussed this out in the research uh, because they've separated it away from kind of this subjective reporting of like, oh, yeah, I bought it because it was scarce or I bought it because the, the person smiled at me and I smiled back. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And we've got this question uh, in the chat 
says, could you talk about how to persuade different types of people? What differences would be made to persuade someone more empathy-based, uh, being more MPFC activity, or more logic-based, more DLPFC activity? Um, yeah, we'll get into that in the brain. We will. That will be, yeah. that's a great question. We'll, we'll get into the neuroscience and kind of the individual differences later. Um, but we'll just keep going through these, these principles. We're on to number three, right? The authority. And this is one that Taylor, Taylor has a lot of expertise in. Like, just look at his, his name label it has that. Right. <laughs> uh, almost, almost PhD. We're getting there. Yeah. Uh, but no, expert power is huge. Uh, our next episode, we're really going to get into power dynamics and status and all of these kind of things. But, um, They've done all of these studies that show that like if someone, if, an, if a person comes into a courtroom and shows a picture of a brain, even if that picture of a brain is like not even tied to what they're talking about, they just have a picture of a brain in the room, uh, they are viewed as being a lot more of an expert. Uh, and they are able to persuade the jurors a lot more effectively than other people. Uh, and this is something that it doesn't have to come with credentials or anything. It's if you just are seen as having more knowledge than someone, then there's this upward comparison thing that happens, right? We are constantly in our society engaging in social comparison. We're engaging in downward social comparison of saying like, this person has less competency, less knowledge than me, and I know more than them, so I'm not gonna listen to them, I'm not gonna be persuaded by them. But if you, as the persuader, can convince someone that you have some special knowledge, that you have something that they don't have, then that's going to pique their interest. Uh, it has to be, I mean, we'll get into the nuance of that because it has to be something that they actually care about. Uh, but just having that that hint, uh, it helps to have credentials and all of these kind of things. People with PhDs sell more books, right? Even though they're saying the exact same thing as someone without a PhD, they sell more books just because they have the credentials to back it up. Yeah, and I, I wasn't just saying that uh, Taylor can do <laughs> on this because he has a master's degree, but because he he's taught uh, the uh, course. I actually was just listening to his lecture this morning on power dynamics. It's fascinating. We'll link that in the uh, description. But um, also, yeah, just on that point of authors uh, listing their credentials and selling more books, I was I thought of Deepak Chopra, the kind of like <laughs> spiritual guru slash med medicine man. I don't know. He has a uh, he has an MD, he's a doctor and he'll, you know, have a book that's about some, something spiritual and then just, you know, Deepak Chopra MD, as if having a medical degree makes you, you know, more qualified to talk about quantum healing or whatever it is he's, he's talking about. I mean, I've even heard the some of the talks that Cialdini does that, that we are like talking about, like his principles of persuasion. He's had people that have reached out to him and they're like, why do you even put references in your book? Like, we trust you. We know that, that you're telling us the truth. And he's like, well, I, I want people to have access to where I got the information from. Uh, but it's just it's kind of an interesting kind of twist on how people just kind of fall into that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And there's just so many examples of that, of like mm -hmm. authorities and charismatic leaders getting people to do things because they're in positions of authority. Um, and we could go on about that, but I think we should probably keep <laughs> yeah, yeah. blasting through these principles. Um, so number four is consistency. And this one's interesting. So people prefer to be consistent with their previous statements or actions, especially when they've made those uh, in public. No, absolutely. And that's that, that one's huge. Uh, and it's something that you see like in conflict, like if someone takes a position early in conflict, even if like all of the logic is telling them no, they stick to it because it's like something that they've like proclaimed that like, this is my stance, right? Uh, and this is something that salespeople really pick up on. It's like, if I can get you to, to like sign a petition and then like put your email down, then all of a sudden now you've like said that you're for this cause and now you're getting emails and now you need to prove to yourself that you're for this cause and all of these things. Uh, it's this kind of slip slope that as soon as you make this commitment it becomes part of like who you are and your self-concept you then have to prove it to yourself yeah and it's just this sort of i mean it has to do with the confirmation bias uh like that we we you know once we believe something it's harder for us to accept contradictory evidence that indicates that we're we were wrong and i think also just the public aspect of it like we don't want to look stupid we don't want to look like we we're foolish or we were just 
you know, saying something, uh, even though it wasn't like now we're going back to, oh, that wasn't true. And interestingly, that that can actually I think there's evidence that when you you do go back on something and say, oh, I was wrong about this, uh, it can increase people's trust in you as an expert, yeah. um, which is an interesting uh, like caveat to this. Um, or it's I guess it's a it's related, but but different because we're talking about from the being persuaded perspective. Um, but anyway, so so, yeah, like Taylor mentioned, signing a petition saying that you'll vote for a certain candidate increases the likelihood that you'll actually go out and vote for that candidate, even if your views haven't changed uh, at all. Mm -hmm. So um, that's that's one there. Uh, do we want to go next one? Yeah. Yeah. So the next one's liking. Uh, and I think this is probably this one and the next one, I think, are probably the most important. Uh, is that you are, tend to be persuaded by someone that that you like that has something they're able to connect with something in you they 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 have something that's similar they have similar interests they have similar beliefs or values or whatever it is uh, and this is so much driven by our need to be social our need to to belong to be accepted and to find other people that are like us that uh, like when you really think about identity identity has this like this very like idiosyncratic self component to it where it's like my preferences and what I like and my personality traits. But so much of our identity is relational. It's, it's about our connections with other people, the people that are like us, the people that have the, like the same sports team and that, that are from the same like city or the same community. Right. Uh, and this is something that salespeople a lot of the time will try to pick up on in the moment. Uh, they'll, I mean, most salespeople are only getting this really small snippet of, of you, but they're trying to figure out like, what are those things that like, where are you from? What kind of things are you into? And then they try to get the conversation going that way to show like, oh yeah, I like those things too. I'm like that too. I have similar experiences. Um, and the more you can connect with that, the more, and we'll get into kind of the brain side of this because it's fascinating. Um, but this is, this is a, a really big one that's going to drive value in your brain. Yeah, I think this might have to do with uh, there's the, I don't know if it's really backed up by empirical evidence, but that in debates, when people uh, can make a joke and get the audience to laugh, they're more likely to win the debate just based on that laugh. And that might be like people like, oh, I like this guy. He's fun. <laughs> like he gets my sense of humor, my values. Uh, I like him like and, and just that just sort of influencing their decision of, you know, what was the better argument? Um but with think, all this, oh yeah, go for yeah, it. No, no, I just, I think you're touching on something that's really important because so much of the time when we're being persuaded, we're not necessarily being persuaded by the message. That like, there's tons of evidence that just shows that having an attractive person is a result of having more people being persuaded. Uh, it has nothing. Well, I mean, sometimes it does. And we'll get into the, the nuance of like when the message actually matters. Uh, but there's so much of that equation that's just the personality and the charisma and everything that's coming from that person. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And but with all this stuff, it's good to just keep in mind, like, none of this is going to be, you know, perfect sil silver bullet, like, you know, you apply all these principles and you're uh, guaranteed to get a yes or whatever. <laughs> this is all just like nudging, you know, way of nudging people toward that uh yes and then We'd be okay. millionaires by now <laughs> yeah exactly yeah okay so number six is uh social proof um so this one uh people often look to others behaviors to guide their own actions especially in uncertain situations so like i think a great example of this is if you're in a foreign country and you don't know what like the etiquette is at restaurants or just in like public behavior. Um, and so you look to other people, you look to like the, the people that live there, what are they doing? Um, how should I act? How should I be in this situation? Um, but there's so many examples of this. I, I actually, I lived in Dubai for a year. Um, and that, that one like hit close to home for me because I remember I, I was, I was working with a, a company that was like very heavily like Indian influence from India, uh, Gujarat. Uh, and they had this whole like kitchen set up, like whole building that was all of these people that had lived there from India. And we went and we were like eating food with all these people. And they had a very specific way that they like, they wash their hands afterwards. They like wash their face and like drink water out of their hands and all of these things. And I found myself just like, 
doing that. Like, like I, I've washed my hands a million times in America, but somehow just being around all these people that were doing the exact same thing, I just kind of fell into it and fell in line with. Uh, and one of the things that I think is really important to highlight with this is the power of social norms. Um, social norms are things that we don't really think about. They're things that we just follow. And they're the things that structure society. They're the things that create dissonance. When we see someone that's doing something that's against a social rule, it just like feels like weird inside of us. Uh, and like you see someone like breastfeeding in public, which is like totally fine because like the baby needs to eat. Do you want to go eat in the bathroom? Uh, <laughs> but there's something about the way that our culture had like designed the norms around it that there's this dissonance that comes up inside of it. Something I had to work with with like my wife and our child. But <laughs> <laughs> you felt the, the social proof working against you. <laughs> right. But it's also, you know, if you're watching this video, maybe later on um, after it's aired, you will see, you know, a a number of view, how many views did it get? Um, how many likes did it get? And that can influence whether you're going to watch it or not, right? If you yeah. search for a video about the neuroscience of persuasion and there's one like ours that has like millions and millions and millions of views, <laughs> and then there's another that has like three views, well, you know, you're probably going to go with the one that has millions of views because uh, there's some probably some reason that people like it. Um, and again, like, I just want to emphasize all this stuff. It can sound like we're just saying, oh, people are stupid and they're easy to manipulate. And it's like a lot of this is based on like a rational, uh, some kind of rational principle. Like, oh, well, why do millions of people like the social brain and not some random <laughs> other uh, podcast? Well, because it's a superior, amazing, you know, extremely informative, <laughs> fascinating and engaging podcast. But <laughs> experts. <laughs> yeah. uh, and it's uh, when you really look at a lot of the messaging. So like look at messaging that's put out uh, about like changing health behaviors. Um, like a lot of the stuff that was done like during COVID to kind of convince people to, to abide by health mandates and all of these kind of things. Um, they've done a ton of studies on which ones were actually successful in promoting behavior change towards healthy behaviors, towards eating well, towards using sunscreen or whatever it may be. And a lot of the successful ones are the ones that have messages that talk about how everyone else is doing this. They set up some type of social norm in the actual message. They say like, this is something that has been successful for so many people, right? Uh, and, and that really kind of gets you to say like, oh, well, I mean, if, if all of these people are, are getting benefits and changing their health and losing weight, then maybe I can too. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And like the, uh, the class, one of the classic examples is like people, um, energy use in their homes, like electricity use. Oh. There's these studies where they'll send out, um, these like newsletters in the mail and people will have them and it says like, here's your energy use compared to your neighbors and uh, showing like, oh, these are the really efficient neighbors. And then you're kind of, you're not quite as efficient as your neighbors, you know, like, don't you want to be efficient like them? Don't you want to like save the environment and save money? And then that does change people's behavior just based on, okay, what's everybody else doing? Um, and then also, you know, people's desire to save the environment and energy and money and everything. And I think, too, as we're kind of getting to the end of these principles, something that's really important to remember is that like these, these are not in isolation from one another, right? These are all things that you like mix and match to actually create a powerful persuasive message. So like what, what Andrew was just talking about with these, these newsletters that went out to houses telling them about their, their neighbor's consumption. I, uh, the other principle of consistency is something that like, if that messaging stops, so does the behavior a lot of the times. And like, prolonged existing change usually requires having to bring in other persuasive messages on top of that uh, to really ingrain these things as like habits and things that, that kind of move forward as actual behavior change. Yeah, that's awesome. And so the last one, the last principle, uh, the seventh one that was added later uh, is called unity. And this is just mm -hmm. basically the idea that we're much more likely to comply with a request made by somebody who we consider to be of us, to be just like us in some very important core way. They're our tribe, uh, yeah. you know, maybe a religious affiliation, something that is, is really important to our core values. They are like part of us. And this will get us into talking about the, the neuroscience a bit. 
Yeah, and it actually ties back into the question that we got about persuading someone that's more empathy based, right? This is really getting into a lot of that. We had a whole episode on empathy that really highlighted the the importance of in group type stuff that we tend to have a lot more empathy for people that are like us, that are part of us, that are part of our clan, that are close to us. Um, and those types of messaging for people like that, that are really kind of tune into the, the in-group type conformity pressures and things like that. Uh, those are the kind of messages that are really strong are the ones that are like, this is who we are. This is this is us as a group. Right. Uh, and this is what we do. This is who we are. Uh, and whereas so the question was like other people that are more logic based, um, there's some similarities. So. One of the things that we're about to get into is we're going to talk a lot about the VMPFC, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, uh, which is right in here. Uh, Andrew's got a picture he's going to put up that's I'll going to highlight some of these brain regions that we're going to talk about because there's the, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex and then there's the ventral striatum, uh, which are heavily, heavily part of the, the whole valuation system in our brain. Uh, yep. So VMPFC. So this up at the top is the front of our brain. Uh, if you guys are listening on the podcast, this is right above your eyeballs. It's kind of in the middle of the fold where your frontal lobes kind of fold in. Um, and then the, the ventral striatum is actually pretty deep in the brain. This is an older brain structure. These are they're kind of like the, the primitive uh, motivation highlighted like dopamine systems that really kind of uh, get us to go out and achieve things and find things and uh, value things. But the, the part in the frontal lobe is the part that is a lot more kind of human, a lot more uh, expanded and uh, advanced. Uh, and it includes a lot of what the studies have been done. My research in general focuses really heavily on the self. Uh, and this, when you put someone in the scanner, you have them think about their traits, about who they are, about things that they own, like anything that's related to them. You have this area in the frontal lobe, this this kind of down near the bottom, in the middle, uh, that lights up really, really robustly. And so getting back to this this person's question, and we can kind of, I think we can take the, the picture down, uh, is that they've done these studies that early on when they were trying to figure out like where, where the self region is versus where the region is when we're thinking about other people, uh, the self tends to be kind of further down near the eyes. But when we're thinking about other people, we have this region that's a little bit higher, a little more dorsal that lights up. And these initial studies found that when they started to manipulate who the person was, uh, if they were similar political affiliation or had similar like likes and dislikes, that the activity started to drift down into what we thought was like self land. Uh, and then there were some follow ups that said it's not really similarity per se, but it's, it's like clan mentality. It's people that are in our in-group tend to really light up this region of the brain that we kind of consider to be the self region of the brain. And if you've kind of watched the show for a while, we we talk a lot about this brain region. Um, and one of the things that we're really going to lean into today is that this region is also heavily tied into the value system. And when you really think about it, I mean, there's some authors that have gone so far as to say that the self is nothing but value, uh, that the closer someone is to us, the closer they are to our in-group, the more we're going to value them. We're going to care about our social relationship with them. We're going to care about whether or not we're going to uh, uh, upset them and create anger in them or whatever it is. And all of that needs to be calculated in a planful way, which happens in the frontal cortex, uh, which we also think is kind of what's holding on to our set of preferences and beliefs and who we are, our self-concept, which I think is going to be really important as we kind of dig into some of this, uh, this neuroscience stuff. So, yeah. And so to, uh, to piggyback on that and uh, talk about the question a little more. So what differences would be made to persuade someone more empathy based versus more logic based? Um, well, like Taylor saying that the similarity as we'll talk about comes down to this value system, like stimulating, activating that value system is really important for um, getting somebody to, to say yes, getting to persuade them. Um, but like you're saying, there's some people who are more um, maybe more susceptible to social influence. And um, there are others who might be more, you know, like you're saying, a little more logic or data driven or evidence based um, in, in some way. So uh, I think it'd be good to think about it as like, you're always trying to get to that person's values. What does what that person value? And then um, maybe the, the routes will differ by if you're 
you know, want to use a more social influence route or a more like, hey, here's the numbers, here's the data, uh, here's the logical <laughs> argument in favor of that. Um, yeah, I guess that's all I can really say about that. Well, and, and we're getting, I think we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but I think it's okay because mm -hmm. uh, there's been these, these interesting studies that show that if I'm trying to persuade you of something that you already have values on that like it's part of like your in group you're so you're wanting to be part of the social thing like it's all kind of connected to your social concept what they see is really heightened vmpfc activation this region that's involved in like self-concept and some of the interpretations of that are that this was already part of your self-concept and so it's already something that you value where we have this heightened thing you don't really have to think much about it right you're just kind of persuaded by the message and the feeling of everything that's going on uh, but then there's other stuff that is not necessarily part of your self-concept yet, but needs to be incorporated into it. That's what the whole behavior change is. And so that's where he, uh, the person that asked the question, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, it's son, I, I say he, I don't know what your pronouns are, but <laughs> uh, but DLPFC. So that's going to be on the outside of the frontal lobe. And what we usually see on the outside of the frontal lobe is planful type stuff, really thinking through the different aspects of things. And that's where the whole idea of being logic based. And there was this really fascinating study that looked at uh, dieters. And we've talked about this on the show before, but the, the successful dieters were the ones that you'd show them a picture of ice cream and for unsuccessful dieters, that would just kick the value system on just like, yeah, I want to eat the ice cream. That's like <laughs> what I love. That's who I am. Uh, but the successful dieters were the ones that could turn on these lateral portions, these outside portions of the frontal lobe and actually think about the long-term consequences. And what they were seeing was that there was this connectivity then to that VMPFC, that medial middle portion of the frontal lobe, that they were adding that into the value signal. That they were saying like, yes, this thing looks really yummy, but it's it's not according to like my long term goals. And I need to add that into this this whole idea of whether I should say yes or no to this. Um, and so that kind of gets to the question, I think. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and so with 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 all this, it's just important to keep in <laughs> mind that the value system is. Um, well, the, the neuroscientist, Emily Falk, who has done a lot of the, the work in this area, she refers to it as kind of the, the common the, the common neural pathway to persuasion. And so um, she talks about if, if you can remind people of what their core values are relevant to the message that you, you are trying to persuade them of um, beforehand, they're more likely to to say yes. So like if you're trying to convince somebody to stop smoking, reminding them that you want to be around long enough to see your kids, you know, graduate from college or, or whatever is really important to that person. You want to have a long, healthy life. Um, if you can remind them of, of that beforehand, they're more likely to, uh, be persuaded by anti-smoking messages than if you were telling them like, here's all the terrible things about smoking. Here's all the carcinogens that are in cigarettes. And, um, and it shows in, in the neuroscience or like in the brain data that, uh, that affirmation beforehand of their values activates that the VMPFC to a greater degree. And that predicts their, uh, how persuaded, how likely they are to be persuaded. And there's there's some fascinating stuff that kind of comes from that, too. So like we we have these people in the scanner, we've kind of figured out that like this region in the frontal lobe and like this, this, this older kind of value system, dopamine system um, is heavily tied to these this predictive power of like, if this thing is really active, this person is going to change their behavior is going to accept this message is going to be persuaded. Uh, and something that I saw that was fascinating, um, and I might be getting ahead a little bit, but was the idea that you could, you could take a group. So, uh, Andrew was talking about like anti-smoking ads, right? Uh, take a, a, a small sample of people and you show them these various anti-smoking ads, right? And you get this, this various activity in their brain of like, oh, wow, this ad really got those value systems cranking up, right? What they then found was that the ads that produced the highest activity in these value systems in their sample actually indicated how successful those ads were on a general population level. Uh, and that's, that's huge. 
right? I mean, we're, we're able to then stick someone in a scanner, show them uh, an advertisement, and then be able to predict how successful that advertisement is going to be for thousands, millions of people in terms of uh, people signing up for newsletters, people actually like uh, sharing the information uh, through like tweet retweets or anything like that. Uh, it really kind of interesting connection that has some predictive power. And, and like one of the most interesting things about that is that it's the predictive power of the, the activation of the value system is above and beyond the self-reported measures of how effective those ads yes. are. So people will say like, oh, like you ask them, how, how effective do you think that anti-smoking ad will be? And they might give it, you know, a, a three out of 10. I'm just making these numbers up. But then, <laughs> then uh, their brain, if their brain shows, uh, you know, more activity in the value system when they're watching that ad, that's actually a better predictor than what they say, how, how effective they yeah. report that ad to be. So it's just really fascinating that she's found these um, correlations. I, uh, I saw a talk uh, a while back by a researcher named Brian Knudsen. He's uh, really big in the neuroeconomic uh, side of things. So uh, advertisement and changing. Uh, and he was seeing similar stuff like this, uh, not in terms of like changing your uh, your behavior on smoking, but in terms of whether you're going to buy something. Um, and he found this similar thing that these uh, this activation in these value systems was predicting like purchasing behavior in these large populations. But he actually found too that there are certain people that are better predictors of this than other people. Uh, and he kind of made the the joke at the beginning of his talk of, uh, I don't know if I'm like dating myself, how many people have seen the minority report, uh, but there's like these, these people that are like all the precogs that are like hooked to this machine and they're the ones that can like predict the future. Uh, and he was kind of making the joke that that's like where they're moving with a lot of this neuroeconomic stuff is they're trying to find the people, the subjects that are the most predictive of market changes uh, and seeing like, okay, we're going to show our ads to these people and we're going to see what their brain does. And then we're going to use that ad. That is, yeah, it's, it's interesting and slightly unsettling, I guess. Um, uh, here we go. Th we got a, a Thanks, fun Robin. comment in the chat <laughs> from Robin. Uh, hello, gentlemen. I have no idea how I ended up on this live feed but I am here. Good talk. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Uh, however you ended up here. Um, <laughs> so, okay. I Should think, we talk about difference between communicator and receiver? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you want to go with that? Yeah. So there's the, the interesting thing is like we found that this, this value system was, was kind of tied into this persuasion, the effectiveness of the persuasion, but it really led the researchers to start saying like, well, is there a difference between what's going on in the brain of the communicator and what's going on in the brain of the, the actual receiver of the persuasion? Um, and it's really interesting because when you look at the actual communicator, they're actually activating a lot of these value regions when they're sharing the information. Um, and it, it also ties into like the type of information you're sharing is really important in terms of whether it's activating these things. And it ties into a lot of the social psychology around this, that we like to share information that is is going to get other people to like us, uh, is going to get other people to to smile and to to light up and accept us and and bring us into the fold or whatever. Um, I remember when I was teaching this group dynamics class, there's this really interesting data on uh, when you're discussing things, like uh, let's say you're having a meeting with all these people that you work with, what tends to happen is that everyone shares information that everyone already knows. Uh, and it's because there's this feeling that if I share something that everyone knows, everyone's going to know that I know it too. And so they're going to say like, oh yeah, he's part of our group. Like he knows what we know. Uh, but it actually hurts the group because you don't end up actually talking about things that you need to talk about that only a couple of people know. Um, and it's there's just something valuable about, about connecting through kind of sharing and talk. So and it'll tie in later when we get into like synchrony between people. But there's something about the salesperson themselves, the persuader, the educator, whatever. Uh, me right now, like getting passionate and talking about these things, I'm probably activating a lot of the same value regions that you might be when you're actually being persuaded as well. Yeah. And uh, and that's interesting when we, we get to... I mean, I feel like a lot of this, we've been talking about the receiver's perspective. We've been talking about what happens in the brain that predicts whether you're you know, likely to comply with a request or say yes to a salesperson or something. Um, 
And so we, like we talked about the MPFC and the ventral striatum. And then as, as Taylor's saying, in the communicator, a lot of these same regions, the same system is activating. And so there's this really interesting finding again from, from Emily Falk and uh, Christine Schultz, I believe, or Kristen Schultz. Um, they they uh, talk about um, biological coupling. So like yeah. synchronization in brain activity uh, as being a, a predictor of successful persuasion. And I think, you know, Taylor is really an, a real expert in that <laughs> specific area of social neuroscience. I feel like you should probably yeah. talk about that. Uh, this is fascinating. I, I think one of our earliest episodes was on like neurosynchrony. Uh, and it, it's, it's so interesting that like, that we even came across this because we're talking about two people's brains in two completely different like places in space. There's no connection between our brains, yet somehow we're finding evidence that our, our neural patterns. So the actual pattern of activity is similar across people in certain contexts. Uh, the actual like wave patterns getting on the same wavelength tends to happen. Uh, and they found all of these instances where we are essentially getting on the same wavelength as another person. And in terms of persuasion, it actually predicts outcomes. So I've seen studies that show that uh, they'll have these, uh, these caps on people uh, when they're in a classroom. Uh, and so they have one on the teacher and they'll have one on the students. And they actually find that the students that are synced up to the same kind of wavelengths as the teacher are the ones that end up having the best grades on the test. Uh, they're the ones that like actually get the message and get persuaded. Um, and so there is something about kind of getting into and you, you feel it, right? Uh, you feel it with like your friends, with other people, like when it's just easy, there's like this flow to it. Uh, there is some evidence stating that that, that feeling could be you kind of getting into sync. Um, one of the things that's really difficult though, is that there's not a lot of clear evidence about whether or not there's like this chicken or the egg type effect uh, that are we just getting on the same wavelength because we're pre disposed to just be on the same wavelength because we're we like the same stuff we've had similar experiences and so we're activating kind of some of the same perceptions um or is there something about our interaction that's actually causing that synchrony um and i think that a lot of researchers are actually leaning that way based on some of these things that they're doing with having two people in scanners at the same time having conversations with one another and persuading each other and you're starting to see this like this synchrony activity happening I, I don't know how it's happening and it's fascinating. Yeah, and, and uh, talking about some of your research specifically, uh, you've looked at um, people in the same groups and that, and I'll probably butcher the actual finding, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> something like um, that, that if, I'm, if I feel more similar or closer to you, that my uh, brain activity is likely to be more in sync with yours. Yeah, yeah. So uh, <laughs> one of the original studies that showed this was a Parkinson study, uh, not Parkinson's, uh, Carolyn Parkinson. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, she actually, she had this, this whole business school where she she mapped out all of the social relationships in this business school. So she knew who was connected to who and all of these things. And then she showed everybody media clips, comedy clips, news clips, all of these different kind of things that you would encounter in the real world, different sorts of persuasion, uh, different messages, all of these things. And what she found was that she could predict who was friends with who based on whose brain activity was the most similar. Um, and then in our study, we found that like if me and Andrew are really close friends, that the actual pattern of activity in these regions that do social stuff uh, was really similar when we were thinking about another person in our group. So if we were thinking about Sally or whatever, Andrew and I have a really similar representation of Sally in terms of brain activity patterns uh, if we're really close friends. And so there's something about that, right? And it, it ties back into some of these principles that we've been talking about in terms of persuasion, about in-group mentality, about liking, about similarity. Uh, all of these things really tie into self-concept, right? They tie into like, this person is like me. And so I'm going to try to maybe get on the same wavelength as this person. I'm, I'm going to open myself up to that. Whereas if all of a sudden there's some red flag, right? You're talking to some sleazy salesman and they're pretending that they like you, but you're you're really kind of sensing the BS, right? Uh, I think a lot of that, you you can put up walls to kind of stop that. 
uh, and to instead of kind of being persuaded by the charisma, by these these feelings and the liking, uh, you tend to then end up in kind of the logic brain and thinking about the the quality of things. That's awesome. That's where I was going. I'm <laughs> glad you <laughs> clarified that. Um, okay, so so we got a, a little bit of time left, and maybe we should return to kind of helping uh, people become more effective persuaders based on what we've talking about, been talking about. And I think the, the main thing that you will always encounter if you've, you know, done any reading about marketing or, or just been in that field at all um, is understand your audience, understand who you're talking to and what their values are, because understanding that uh, will allow you to talk to what really matters to them to activate these value systems and allow your message to be more persuasive because it's actually getting into their self-concept and, and what they care about. And there's a, there's a little tidbit that's really cool with this too. Uh, so we talked on our last episode, it was about empathy, but we got into this idea about theory of mind, uh, that there are these regions in our brain. Uh, there's the right temporal parietal junction, which is kind of back here above your ear, uh, and the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex that we've kind of talked about, uh, but that seem to be ways in which we think about the perspectives and the minds of other people. Um, and they've actually found in these persuasion studies that successful persuaders, so the actual person that's trying to deliver the message, is trying to sell you something or educate you, um, they tend to activate these theory of mind regions of their brain more robustly. Uh, and they found that like the more successful they were, the more robust the activity was in these regions. Uh, and when you really think about that, they're trying to put themselves in the shoes of the person they're persuading. They're trying to understand their audience, right? And we mentioned earlier that usually when you're selling something, you only have these tidbits of who that actual person is. And so you have to use these models of, of stereotypical beliefs about kind of the things that this person from this city that likes these things probably likes too, to be able to tap into what it is that's going to resonate with them in terms of persuasion. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, okay, so uh, understanding your audience, you know, part of that too is is making yourself likable to a particular audience, making yourself, um, you know, like s some of these things we've been talking about with likability, uh, you know, showing similarity, showing, um, you know, giving compliments or uh, um, other ways of getting people to feel like, okay, this, this is a person that I like them, you know, telling those jokes that get the laugh during the debate is going to give you a better chance of winning the debate. Mm -hmm. You know, your argument might not be all that good, but if you can be funny and clever, uh, you might have a better chance of winning the debate, which, you know, how <laughs> valuable is that? I don't know. But uh, if there's any debaters out there, maybe work on your stand up comedy skills. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that so much of this is, is, uh, self and social relevance. Uh, there's this this whole thing when you go to do like a, a job uh, interview. A lot of times for like sales positions, they'll do this thing where they'll like hand you a pen and they'll say, "Sell me this pen," right? And you have a certain group of people will talk about how great the pen is, right? Like look at the look at the bevel and and it's so smooth and it's got this this like rubber grip. It's so nice. The successful ones, the ones that usually get the job are the ones that make it self-relevant, right? They turn it on the interviewer and they say, how much writing do you do in a day? Man, your hand probably gets really tired, doesn't it? Like that is, that has gotta be exhausting. I mean, you go home, your hand's all cramped up. I'm sure you can't even type on your computer anymore. I mean, look at this pen. Look at how smooth these things are and how comfy this would probably be for your fingers. Like this pen is made for you, right? It's, it's those kind of things where you're like, you're tying it into to their experience, to who they are to the things that they, the struggles that they go through, the, the difficulties that they had, that's what really determines whether or not something's going to be successful in terms of selling it. Um, that ties into the sense of, of self kind of component. Uh, but then there's other sales tactics that are about like the social component, right? All of these norms that we've been talking about, really enforcing that like, you know what? Everybody uses pens like this that I know. You know, I, I, I knew the all these people. Most popular pen on the market. Most popular pen on the market. I mean, I, I worked in this office and people had like, cramped up hands all the time, but all of them, they all switched to this pen and they haven't complained once. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's so good. Cause it's, uh, it ties into this marketing and sales. They often talk about benefits 
rather than features. You should, you should emphasize the benefits that come from a particular feature of like the pen. Okay. It's got this rubber grip. You could, if you were going to talk about features, you could say, oh yeah, it's, it's uh, made of, you know, this composite poly blah, blah, blah material <laughs> that uh, it's amazing. Or you could say this grip, this sticks to your hand and it will, you, you won't drop the pen. It'll be a lot more comfortable while you're writing. So emphasizing the benefits over the features, you know, um, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, it's I I mean, everything that we're talking about really ties into the default mode network. Uh, we have a whole episode on default mode network if you want to check it out. Uh, but it's the system that uh, part of what we've been talking about is part of it. This VMPFC, this like self concept, beliefs, values, preferences and all of that. But a lot of it, too, is is memory is past experiences and uh, and future simulation and all of these kind of things. And so the more you can tie into every single one of those elements, the more robust you can get this signal. Um, and I, I do work personally on kind of the self and, and other and everything like that. Um, and what I've seen is that the more self-relevant something is, you end up with what we call in like the, the brain research world is like gain modulation, is that these regions that do this end up getting super active the more self-relevant it is. And it's kind of a step ladder. Like the further away you get from the self, the less active this thing gets. Um, and so that's something that if we're saying that like these self regions are also heavily tied into value, that's really what you need to go towards. Yeah, and and to kind of uh, bring this back to what we were saying at the beginning, um, this can sound again, really, it can, it can come off as a bit manipulative. And I what I wanna emphasize is like, the best way to convince somebody that your product or what you're trying to convince them of is valuable is to actually make it valuable because you might be able to use some of these tactics the first time around, you know, sell them your widget one on day one. But if it's a crappy thing and you lied about how it's going to help them and all these benefits, they're not going to come back to buy that. And it's also just, you know, you're lying and that's unethical and everything. But um, but just like from a purely utilitarian perspective, it's it's better to to be honest and to actually make something really good. Like that's what um, if you guys know of Mr. Beast, the like biggest YouTuber <laughs> on the planet, he when he gives advice to small channels, when he talks to YouTubers, he says the only thing you should like, like the primary thing you should focus your energy and time on is creating the best video you possibly can for your audience. Right. And so that's the thing is it has to actually be valuable. In the end, this stuff is all important to like framing your argument in the right way and using these levers of, of social influence. But then at the at the end of the day, it's the value that that you actually deliver that is going to really solidify for that person. This is valuable to me. This is part of could become part of your self-concept or is just so valuable in your personal life that, wow, yeah, this, I, I don't even need advertisements anymore to convince me to, to watch the social brain, for example. <laughs> uh, and I want to, I want to go back a little bit to what you said about manipulation, because um, there, there are probably a lot of people that are like, oh, I'm going to use these to like go pick up chicks and manipulate people or whatever. <laughs> uh, I, but I want, I want people to really kind of get real for a second and think about some of the power of this in terms of actually helping people, right? Think about addiction. Think about trying to get someone to stop using a substance that's that's ruining their family, that's ruining their lives, to, to try to get someone out of a bout of depression and all of the negative self-talk that they go through and all of these things. There's a lot of really clear research that shows that people in these situations tend to have dysregulated frontal lobes, that they tend to have an inability to really think about the future, have hope for the future. And a lot of these, these tactics of persuasion are getting you to think about those things. To, to self-affirm, to think about your values, about who you are. I mean, we we're talking about like quitting smoking earlier, right? Think about quitting like crystal meth or quitting like cocaine or uh, or heroin. I mean, we're in an opioid epidemic, right? Uh, is so much of the success of those persuasive messages really is about getting them to think about what's important to them, right? Their values, like my family. I don't want to destroy my family. I don't want to destroy my health and all of these things. And it's bringing those things to bear in the moment to combat all of this other stuff. And so like, it, it's all kind of tying into this, this same exact system of, of like, your values are so tied up in 
who you are and what you care about. But that kind of stuff tends to get overwhelmed by like in the moment desires. And the more you can like bring up these like self-affirming things, the more you can fight that stuff. I know that's kind of an aside, but no, that's perfect. I made me think of, we had this whole episode on positive psychology and happiness and um, uh, the growth mindset. And I think this all really ties in with that too. If, if you yep. want to be, you know, happier, uh, healthier person, there are certain beliefs that you have, you should incorporate into your, your self image or, or your, your sense of who you are as I am a person who can grow like that with the growth mindset. It's the difference between thinking I failed because I'm a failure, because I'm incapable of this thing, or I failed because I didn't know enough because I didn't know how to do this thing yet. And I'm going to get to that. And I think it is activating that value system. I am a, a, a strong and um, adaptable person who can grow toward this. And remembering that in the face of failure, in the face of loss, can be extremely helpful for allowing you to continue on and grow and, and like create that better future. And we said something earlier about uh, there's these different components of the frontal lobe. There's the outside portion and there's kind of the inside portion. The inside portion tends to be pretty automatic. It tends to be something that's just like, like you see something, you value it, you like it, you don't like it, whatever. Uh, but changing those value systems actually takes effort. And that usually comes from the outside of the brain. And so those are the moments where you're really kind of thinking about what are these new things that I want to incorporate into my values, into my beliefs to really think about who I am. Uh, that feels like friction because it's something that you're putting lots of work into to create. But if you do that, I mean, this is one of the earliest videos that Andrew and I did together about goals and setting goals and all of these things, uh, is that once you put that effort in, it kind of transfers into this middle region. And then it just becomes something that you're you're just continuously tracking and you're you just you're adaptive now. You're, you think that you're powerful. You think that you're, uh, you're capable, uh, but you have to continuously tell yourself that you have to like put that mental effort in to then eventually transfer it into something that's more automatic. Uh, and I wanted to just uh, give a shout out to, to some of these people that have been leaving these really nice comments. Uh, Tink's Bay, I adore your videos, love listening to them on my walks, studying clinical psychology, and they're very helpful. Like, thank you very much. Uh, we absolutely love doing this. It gives us an excuse to, to really dive into this stuff because we're passionate about, about learning about these things, about communicating it. Um, I just stumbled upon this live feed. My recommendations are you fellows neuroscience graduates. Your channels look interesting. So, uh, so yeah, we're we're science communicators. I'm uh, at the end of my PhD, so I have about a year left. Uh, and Andrew is an amazing science communicator. That I met. <laughs> actually, no, he. That's no, really. Uh, we actually met through YouTube. He was doing some really cool neuroscience explainer videos and reached out to me to do uh, interviews, and that kind of kicked off us doing this this whole show. Yeah. And I mean, I, uh, I don't have a, a degree in neuroscience. I, I have a degree in cellular and molecular biology. And then um, I uh, spent a few years working in a neurobiology laboratory, uh, doing some uh, research there at the University of Colorado. And um, so I, I'm not a neuroscience graduate, but I've, I've talked to, interviewed many neuroscientists, <laughs> including this one sitting you know, <laughs> next to me virtually. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. So thank you for uh, checking out this video and our, our channels and everything. Uh, we really do strive to give you like the best information as, as we can find, um, the most up-to-date, accurate science, and really try to distill that down into something that's like useful for your life and for your, your career if possible. Yep. And uh, I think, I mean, we're, we're kind of at the, the end of our, of our live cast right now. And uh, it, it seems like we have a lot of new listeners. Like, thank you for sticking around and tuning in. Uh, we do this every kind of couple of weeks. Uh, and if you really like it, check out some of our older videos. I mean, this is episode, what, 27 that we've done. So we've gotten into lots of stuff around uh, the brain, around health, around uh, decision making, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and we're going to keep doing this as long as we can. Uh, but if you're willing, uh, every little bit helps because we do kind of have lives and uh, have like a family and things like that. And universities don't pay you very well. So uh, any any little bit kind of helps. So yeah, we have so stickers and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, go to patreon.com slash 
the social brain. Uh, you can find out how to support us there. You can also check out our merch stores below um, our video here. I think on either of our channels, there should be a like a strip of, of products you see down below, or you can go to our channel and go to the store tab on YouTube uh, if you want to get any of this cool uh, gear, like this uh, this sticker that I got <laughs> from the Everyone has them. Store. Everyone's Everybody using has. them. Yeah, they, and they will make you more likable. Uh, they'll make you more authoritative. Uh, but yeah, no, check these out. They're actually cool. They, they're like the stickers that don't come off when you wash it and everything. So um, check that out. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody. Honestly, uh, we really love doing this. We love having people be able to tune in from all over the world uh, and to get something out of this that doesn't cost money if, if you don't want to. And so, uh, so thank you. And we will see you guys for the next one.